Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Great Legal Mind Show on Lawvisor. Uh, today I have a very special guest with me. Um, he is a senior advocate in Supreme Court of India. He has been vocal on so many issues that uh, you know he he's worked on. Uh, he was a part of you know Delhi government's uh, council team. He was he, you were heading the you were like I was the, initial standing council. Initial standing council with the Delhi government, and now he is a senior advocate uh, you know on his own. Um, uh, Shanjoy, very warm welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Amar. I just wanted to actually begin, uh, you know, with this very introduction. So, you know, what happens is that when you are like working with the government, you know, what about the? I mean, have you faced any ethical dilemma as a lawyer where you see that there are some matters where uh, you know you have to actually go and defend the government where you don't want to defend the go government at times? So, you know, tell me. I mean, and you know that is. The dilemma a lawyer would very often face, I mean, government or no government. So, what do you have to say about that, Sean? See, first of all, uh, you know, uh, this lawyer Afridi was killed in Peshawar in Pakistan this week only for the kind of cases he was doing. <clears throat> so, we have to be very important. It's very important to understand that a lawyer should never be associated with the cases he does. A lawyer is a professional. Now, coming back to my issue, I had a a decent private practice before I was approached by uh, this uh, the Aam Aadmi Party led government to be one of their government lawyers. And I was quite hesitant to take on this assignment. But one of the things, one of the conditions I had, and, and I must say in six years, I, I never had to sacrifice and compromise this, was that I will not be making any submission in court contrary to what my core beliefs are. And in fact, one of the reasons why I was persuaded to become a government lawyer was I felt that maybe, and maybe it was a mistaken belief in six years, you know, it's very, even in six years, I've tried, 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 but the bureaucracy is the bureaucracy. I believe that maybe in some ways, being on the other side, I can soften and at least help in certain cases where, they, where justice has to be done to the citizens. And in fact, the mandate from the government was just that, that you know, wherever you, uh, you know, wherever you think that justice has to be done to the citizen, uh, concede, cooperate and see it can be done. And I must say, I have never faced any kind of ethical dilemma during that six years. I, I was the lawyer for the Delhi government where I was told that, you know, you have to do this or compromise on your ethics or go against the citizens. And, uh, uh, you know, now that that chapter of my life is over. I'm happy. I'm no longer a government so, lawyer. So, so government, uh, you never asked you to do something like that. Not me. Maybe there are other lawyers, but not me. I was never asked. Okay. Okay. In fact, you know, I'll be coming to, you know, some, you know, very, uh, you know, big matters that had happened at that point of a time. But yeah. before that, I actually wanted to ask you, of, like, you know, a few questions which are there in common people's mind that, you know, do you think that uh, the lawyers, are particularly senior advocates and advocates who are practicing in the courts, should also be specialized the way doctors are specialized, and you know they they actually do certain kind of matters? See, as they say that it is the age of specialization, but again, as they joke that it is such an age of specialization that some say I'm the doctor for the right ear and not the left ear. Okay, so. You know, I believe that you must not consider yourself so specialized where you forget the basics of law. The basics of law, the substratum of law is the constitution, the civil procedure, the criminal procedure and the evidence. And anyone who is sound on these basic laws, I feel with a little bit of hard work can excel in any specialization. Uh, uh, so to answer your question, yes and no, specialization is good and specialization is a call of the time. But at the same time, you know, today you have too much of over pitching that I am a niche lawyer in this particular thing. I'm a niche lawyer in, uh, 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 you know, in PMLA uh, cases, money laundering cases. But if you don't know the constitution, if you don't know your evidence, if you don't know your civil procedure, uh, you know, you can't be a, a niche lawyer in anything. So tell me, Shanjay, what are the areas that you, you, you love when you actually get those matters, you like, you're really excited about them? Well, uh, you know, I am very excited about, frankly, and uh, you know, this is not a Miss World kind of answer. I am very excited about any case where something new 
jurisprudentially or legally can be done. I mean, like I can tell you just two days back, I argued a full final argument in the Delhi High Court on the issue whether the Payment of Bonus Act will apply to workers of charitable hospitals in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And it's a new thing because actually uh, this area of law is not well uh, fleshed out. And whatever the judgment of the court will come will be a precedent. So I, for me, it is whether it be a commercial matter or a human rights matter or a matrimonial matter, any case where there is some opportunity of testing out the frontiers of law is something which really excites me. So I think, so, and the same question I had about the judiciary as well. Do you think the judges also needed to kind of, you know, be bucketed into certain kind of matters? Well, uh, yes, in the sense that, again, I know I'm not giving, uh, you know, proper answers, but it, it is like a diplomatic answer. But, uh, you know, there are certain fields like industrial adjudication or, uh, you know, intellectual property rights. Uh, which are so specialized that you actually need some kind of domain knowledge and sectoral knowledge to deal with these aspects. So often we find that if a, if a judicial officer has assigned these, uh, uh, you know, these uh, particular subjects without that background training, uh, you know, there may be issues. And that is why obviously uh, at one level uh, there is a need for specialization. But as I said, most important in our country is the doddering criminal justice system and frankly you don't need to be too great an expert in criminal law to know how to manage issues of bail how to manage issues of sentencing revisions etc so you know that is the uh, the elephant in the room our criminal justice system and so tell me you know there's another thing that's you know uh, you know that's been going on for a very long time in uh, you know uk and all of that which is barrister chamber and all of that and the way it is run, you know, basically, you know, it's more towards specialization, if I understand that correctly, that the, the clerk decides which matter is to go to whom in terms of his or her expertise and all of that. Do you think, uh, you know, that kind of system, uh, you know, would work well in a country like India? See, the uh, first of all, strictly the barrister solicitor system of the UK doesn't work too much in India, except in two or three uh, targeted pockets like Calcutta and, and Bombay and a little bit in Madras. But according to me, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we are in an information revolution age. So everyone is aware of everything what everyone is doing. So today the client, the briefing lawyer, uh, the consumer of justice easily at the access of a mouse can figure out what law, what, what person is doing. And so willy-nilly, that kind of specialization is happening, if you understand what I mean. Um, you don't have to actually artificially labor towards that. It is happening. Okay. Now, coming back to, um, you know, your days when you were actually, uh, you know, uh, working with Delhi government. Um, you know, Delhi riots happened at that yes. point of time. And I think that resulted in, I think, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, litigations and matters in the court and arrests and all of that. Um, you know, can you please just give me a little brief of your experience at that time, I think? Well, to be very honest, uh, you know, the Delhi riots thing, I, I was the government lawyer for the Delhi police on the civil side because the police has a lot of civil issues also. Um, the police has a different set of lawyers to deal with criminal matters. But on that day, uh, uh, when the riots were going on, I think the second or third day of rioting, I got a call from uh, 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 Justice Murlidhar's um, secretarial staff, his secretary maybe, uh, that he's unable to contact any of the criminal uh, uh, side uh, lawyers. And it was urgent and certain people were actually trapped in a hospital uh, in, in, in that uh, Northwest Delhi or wherever, wherever, Northeast Delhi, wherever this was happening. And... Uh, Urgently certain orders had to be passed and directions had to be given to the police and you know, I had just crawled into bed uh, And the last thing I wanted to do was to be caught in uh, this thing, but obviously uh, I realized that you know, this is a call of duty Which you know, you cannot say no to and I'm so proud of myself that I was actually a part of this process and I believe in this that that act of midnight justice uh, 
singularly was responsible for the rioting to end in Delhi and for saving of not only the lives of those 20 people who were trapped in that uh, hospital, thanks to the brave orders and hearings of Justice Murlidhar and Justice Bambani that night, but uh, it actually stopped the entire rioting thereafter, uh, you know. And uh, it was, uh, all I did was I actually uh, called the police and I said that, you know, this hearing is scheduled, please come. They also came. I did nothing. I just, you know, I was more like a facilitator of getting the police persons and, and uh, at very senior level police uh, were the additional commissioner, uh, DCP. And all of them, uh, all of us actually congregated in Justice Mulidha's residence. It was uh, almost 1, 1.30 at night. And while the hearing was happening and Justice Mulidha and Justice Bambani were very, very cordial, the, the, uh, the proceedings went on in a very cordial way. And what the, ju what the judges did was just nudged the police to take action. And the police, it was a matter of few phone calls. All you needed was uh, police protection for the ambulance to come into that lane and rescue those people from that hospital because many of them had bullet injuries and were fatal. It, was, it could be fatal unless, you know, they were immediately rescued. And, you know, I've said that in another uh, interview where I was asked the same question. And I said that, you know, these are th what the judge did and what I did are very normal and ordinary actions. What the judge did was what in any constitutional court would do when someone would come and say that, you know, please save me. Right. The right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution is for every, every person. And what did I do as a government lawyer is simply pick up, picked up my phone, called my client, the Delhi police, and said, Aap ajao, please come. The fact that these ordinary acts become hailed as extraordinary acts of bravery is actually a sad commentary of the times that we live in. It's really, really nothing ordinary which was done. And of course, many of us have faced the consequences of that night. <laughs> In fact, uh, you know, another thing I wanted to actually talk about, uh, which is that whenever something like this happens, you know, minority community becomes an easy target uh, to be picked up very often. And, uh, and that's fine. I mean, whosoever has done whatever needs to be punished and all of that, but the conviction rate often is very, very low. And this I'm not talking only from the point of view of the current dispensation, but this been the case for like decades. So, you know, what, 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 what do you have to say about, you know, this entire thing and, you know, what changes can be made to kind of, you know, um, you know, for people to see things more objectively and take objective actions. See, what you ask is a very serious issue and I am not trying to downplay that issue. The ideal justice system is a justice system which is blind to the religion of the consumer of justice. The ideal policing system is a system which is, which is blind to who they are policing over. But the fact of the matter is it is not. So, ultimately, because the cases are sub -judice, I am hesitant to talk about the individual cases. But ultimately, I feel it is the responsibility of the judicial system to actually uphold that rule of law, to come heavily on any kind of uh, executive or police uh, overreach, and to restore the faith of the people, whether minority or majority in the constitutional system of government where everyone is treated equally. Yes, there have been aberrations, but I have great hope in this country and I have great hope in the judicial system of our country. You cannot paint all people. Why? You know, when you're talking about judiciary, see everyone, see the police, see the politicians, see lawyers. You can't play, paint all of us, all people of the same class with one, you know, and, 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 as well, with one uh, shade. There are good people, there are good cops, and there are bad cops. There are good lawyers, there are bad lawyers. So there are also people in the judiciary, and you are seeing certain orders being passed of late, where courts are questioning. And I believe that the Supreme Court, which is the apex court of the country, which is like the Bhishma Pitama of the judiciary, if the Supreme Court creates that atmosphere, uh, giving hope to all the courts, the high courts and the subordinate courts all over the country, 
that they should be fearless in dispensing justice. I'm sure, I'm sure that we are soon going to have a system where the faith of everyone will be restored to the rule of law. Okay, uh, Sanjay, actually, uh, let me now uh, come to, you know, very basic questions that, uh, you know, uh, we citizens, you know, uh, face in our day-to-day -day life. Like, for example, you know, there is a, there is a law that says that if you rescue somebody, when there is an accident on the road, you won't be questioned by the police. Um, but very often, um, you know, you are caught in a situation where, like, you know, people still fear that, you know, they may be questioned that, you know, it is, you know, their vehicle that actually did the accident and they don't pick the accident uh, victims and all of that. Yeah, what should actually they, they do? I mean, they, sh should they carry that Supreme Court order and show it every time it happens? You know, what should actually be done? I mean, you know, you know, as normal citizens, everybody has those kind of questions in their mind. No, see, what you're talking about is the Good Samaritan law. And I understand that there is many a slip between what is the law laid down or procedures laid down and ultimately what follows. And unfortunately, I don't have ready-made instant Maggie kind of answers for you because we are dealing with a very complex system. But the point is this, and this is where the focus of all the judiciary as well as the executive has to be. As of today, the process is the punishment. Today I was doing a case, just today I was doing a case in the High Court where the managing director, I was representing the managing director of a, of, of, of a nationwide company is prosecuted because in one of the markets, markets all over the country, some distributor had given one tin can where the marking was wrong. Now, it is very well to say that, you know, it's a criminal prosecution. You go through the prosecution, prove your innocence and one day you'll be free. But as you are seeing, and, I, and I, you know, I was not trying to avoid your quest previous question. You're seeing the people who are languishing in uh, in jail because of this so-called involvement in Delhi riots. Um, the process is, is the punishment. And ultimately, even after 10 years or 5 years, when justice is given, it's too late. So the focus has to be to make law, uh, uh, you know, more convenient to, to ensure that these processes don't become punishments. How, I really don't know. If it may involve a more outreach and more literacy for the police and the first responders. Uh, it may involve uh, also more judicial training and sensitization of the, uh, of the magistracy, which is the, again the first respondent from the judicial side. But something really has to be done. And this process, you know, I'm telling you and take it from me. If this government or any government actually invests not only money, but thought in streamlining this process, not just formally saying ease of business, ease of business, ease of courts. I mean, uh, you know, a naya law, another commercial courts act. And it sounds very fancy for investors that you have a commercial courts act, but you are not doing anything about the infrastructure. You're not doing anything about the legal culture. You're not doing anything about who is going to man the commercial courts. That will not work. Lip servicing will not work. But I always believe this. If you are going to amend and modify the legal system so that the process is no longer the punishment where you ensure that any person charged with any offense will get justice in three months justice in form of punishment or acquittal right. believe me the entire architecture of this country will change the culture of the country will change the culture sure in fact uh, you know you've also worked on uh many matters related to women empowerment and I think there are some very good things that have happened in terms of say for example you know inheritance laws and you know a lot of very good uh, stuff that has happened but I think you know what has also happened so in fact you know I have two related questions one question is that what more is required to be done um, you know for like you know women you know in on different fronts I mean including corporate and so on and so forth on the other hand, you know, at times they say, for example, you know, in, in, in cases of dowry and all of that, you know, uh, there's a gross misuse of, uh, you know, this entire thing as well, where, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, in fact, men suffer uh, in, 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 in those matters. So how do we balance, uh, you know, this entire thing in terms of the, you know, both the genders? Well, you know, that is a thing, the bogey of men suffering is there. 
I understand that often it is misused, but there is no, there is no, trust me, there is no scientific study done of the so-called misuse of the laws in favor of women. I will not say that there is no misuse, but I'm saying so, there is a misuse of so many laws. There is a misuse of so many provisions of the penal code. People who are actually neighbors to settle scores, they file false criminal cases against each other. So will you do away with uh, a murder? Will you do away with theft? Will you do away with other provisions of law? So the objective is not, uh, the solution is not that don't have laws for women. The law by itself is not the deterrent or is not the problem. The problem is again, as I said, the system. In our country, anyone can file a case and it will go on for months and years. And even if it is proven that that case is false or that you have given a false statement, false affidavit, false witness, nothing happens. So this impunity, this culture of impunity has to go. You do know that Jeffrey Archer, who was a member of parliament and who is one of the world's uh, best selling authors, he went to prison. Of course, he wrote a book in prison also. But why did he go to prison? He went to prison because he gave a false affidavit. So that is the culture which you have to bring into India. Moment courts will take it seriously that you can't give false statements. The moment the, the process will be fine tuned, you will see all this will end. And one of the, of course, we, you know, the lawyers also have to take the blame. I, you know, I can't completely whitewash the legal community. Often, because in our country, we don't have the culture of, of conflict resolution. You know, this whole thing, because the process is a punishment and lengthy, people know that if a woman has filed a divorce case, maintenance case, it will go on for five, six years. She will spend on lawyers, she'll go running from here to there, I will file an appeal, I will file an SLP, this matter will go on forever. So I will, you know, make the woman dance. So therefore, often, and if the woman says, I want to settle, let's go to mediation, you, you, you see that as a sign of weakness. So she wants to, uh, she's weak. Or any party, why woman, even she a man. She has come along. Huh? Huh. Or he has come along. Correct. Oh, yeah. So then what do you decide? What do you realize? You realize the only danda they understand is criminal danda. Jab tak police nahi aayega, the husband will not come, 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 you know, come to terms. So then you are forced to file a criminal case. Then the lawyer will say, you know, will you know, at times, you know, put in allegations, which may not, uh, you know, technically occur if actually be borne out, but only because of the desperation to somehow get the husband to come and settle. So it is, it is, uh, it is sad. And one, one last thing. So you know, we were involved in. Uh, in campaigning for the domestic violence law and ultimately our campaign, Ms. Jai Singh of the uh, Indra Jai Singh of the Lawyers Collective, all of us lawyers, uh, we were all involved in and ultimately we got this law, this, uh, this law. In this law for the first time we had added that the government will actually spend money in ensuring publicity for this law and making this law effective. That's the first provision they removed from the law. Ki paisa nahi lagana hai. In this law, for the first time, we provided a concept of a protection officer, a person who will help the woman facing domestic violence access justice, access short stay homes, access hospitals, access counselors. And no state has actually appointed more than five, six. In Delhi, there are a handful like 10, 12, uh, 20 maximum protection officers, whereas you actually need a protection officer in every locality. So the government also has to invest in the laws that you're making. Simply making laws will not do. Law after law after law will be of no use unless you invest in the infrastructure to make that law into effect. Right. So, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, I mean, we can see you very actively promoting on Twitter. Are you not afraid of the trolls that... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I had joined Twitter in 2012. But I was never active until one or two years back. And ultimately, I, you know, I, I became active on Twitter, not uh, for publicity or recognition or business development, as many people say. In fact, it is, uh, uh, it is contrary to, uh, uh, to those aims. Many lawyers have told me that, you know, you're too mufat, you're too uh, open on Twitter and, uh, you know, it's not good for your practice. I came on Twitter or became active on Twitter at a time when I felt that as a conscientious citizen of this country, 
if I do not speak against injustice, if as a member of the bar, I do not speak against injustice, there will be a time in the future when people will be called to account for their actions during such times and I will not be able to hold my head up. My head will hang in shame. I will not be able to tell my future generations, my child, when I am asked, what did you do? What did you do? What did you say? What was your stand? And believe me, uh, I may not do much, but the fact that I speak out and often I'm advised that, you know, you will be in trouble. You will, uh, you know, you are, you are, you've had it. For every of those kind of statements, there are so many come and tell me that, thank you so much. Right. That you are saying something which I am so scared to say, but at least you are saying it for me. Right. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's a huge section that doesn't, that wants to say something, but they don't say. And it's understandable why they, they may not be in a, yeah, in a position to yeah, say so. Yeah. And thank you so much, Sanjay, for being their voice, actually. Now, let me ask you one last question. But I think one of the very interesting things that I <coughs> picked up was that uh, you have this very interesting uh, collection of uh, autographs. <laughs> How did you actually uh, develop your interest in something like this? Well, uh, it was out of uh, actual anger that I lost out on my family autograph book. In fact, my great grandmother, who was very religious, had got to know that a holy man has come to our town, Jalpaiguri, which is in North Bengal. And she sent message because, you know, my great grandfather was a, a wealthy, well-known person in, in the town. And she sent message that asked this holy Baba to come and visit me. And the holy Baba uh, said that I don't do house visits, which my great grandmother would not take easily. She said that I will pay. <laughs> so then this holy man said that will she pay 300 guineas, gold guineas. And it became an ego issue for my great grandmother. And she said, I will pay. So this holy man actually came to our house and my grandmother gave 300 guineas, which of course this holy man dedicated to his political party because he used to charge one rupee for an autograph in those days and he made 300 guineas out of this old lady. But Mahatma Gandhi never took any money uh, uh, for himself. Mahatma Gandhi actually gave that money for the Congress party. So Gandhiji actually gave an autograph. He came to our house and he, he was the holy man. It was, a, it was Gandhiji. Oh. Oh so God. this autograph actually a uh, book which also had autograph of Netaji and many other people went to my cousin, my, my father's elder brother's daughter. And I missed out on that. So I said, now, you know, I must build my own uh, collection of autographs. So I still haven't got a Gandhi autograph though. <laughs> <laughs> but lots of very interesting ones. And, uh, you know, uh, why don't we why don't you take us through you know some of the you know autographs that 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 you've collected here sure it's a pleasure Let's most pleasure that. come okay yeah uh, so here this is my most uh, important room uh, of autographs so this is the autograph of dada boy naroji you know the grand old man of india the first indian who was a uh, member of british parliament this is sarojini naidu uh, and it's a rare photograph vintage photograph so i try to also collect a photograph along with the autograph. So this is where they've gone to attend the round table conference. You know, uh, Sarojini Naidu used to call Gandhi Mickey Mouse. And she's the only one who had the right to, you know, give Bapu left, right and center. Okay. This, uh, you know, is Tagore. Tagore in English. And look at the beautiful handwriting of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. This is in Tagore in English. And this is Tagore in Bengali, where he says Ashirvad, Rabindranath Thakur. And these are also beautiful vintage photographs of Tagore. So this is what I call my prime ministerial uh, wall. That is Charan Singh. This is uh, Panditji uh, in Hindi. Yes. This is Babu Jagjeevan Ram. Indira Gandhi in yeah. English. Different photographs. Yes, yes. This is, like this is Nehru in uh, uh, in English. That is Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. Again, see a rare vintage photo of him swearing in Mrs. Gandhi. Yeah. This is the uh, letter written by Justice Vivian Bose, one of the greatest jurists uh, the Supreme Court has seen. This wall I call War and Peace, or War or Peace, as you want to see it. Uh, uh, this is India side, where the two Prime Ministers of India are there. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi and Narasimha Rao. And uh, this is of 
Field Marshal Ayub, who was the dictator of Pakistan. Uh, you can see this letter also, the cover letter giving this autograph, signed autograph over here. Right. This is Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who needs no introduction. <laughs> this is an autograph picture of Zulfikar yeah. Ali Bhutto. He was hanged yeah. and he died an, uh, a horrific death. Yes. These two faded into... Yeah. This is another one of Indira Gandhi uh, with the Indira Gandhi's autograph in, in Hindi. Yeah. So I have three Indira Gandhi photographs. One that you saw there was in English. This is in Hindi, there's another one in English, which I'll show you. Okay. A mixture of a lot of people. This is Indira Gandhi in, uh, uh, in, Hindi, uh, in English, as I was saying. This is C.V. Raman. Raman. This is Sophia Loren. This is Siri Mabo Bhanda Naike, the Lady Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. This is Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. This is Mussolini. Wow. <laughs> this is a rare thing. <laughs> yes. The dictator of Italy. And look at the kind of photograph yes, it is. Yes, huge. And yeah. Hitler's ally. Uh, this is uh, the Viceroy and the Viceroy, Edwina Mountbatten and Lord Louis Mountbatten. And uh, then let's go to that wall. Okay, these are various. Uh, this is the Hollywood wall. The Hollywood wall. But of course, there's an autograph of Her Majesty the Queen over there. Oh. So and nowadays I'm told Gandhi autograph. No, this is not. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the actual Gandhi yeah. autograph. Yeah. So I'm told this is not a uh, era of autographs anymore. People are into selfies now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you so much, Sanjay, for being uh, on the show today. A very, very good conversation. Thank I you. Really thank you, Mark, for having me. That. Yeah. Thank you so much.